Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things, and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my peers and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Jeffrey Blum. Jeff is the owner of Vertilite Consulting, a company that specializes in EMC compliance. Jeff, welcome to the pod. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Happy to have you on. It's been a while. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's It's been a while since grad school, hasn't it? Yeah. yeah. For people listening, uh, Jeffrey and I went to grad school together, the uh, Master's in Robotic Systems Development at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, it seems like we went pretty different paths, but not that different. We both have contract engineering companies. Uh, what made you decide to go down the EMC road? So, uh, obviously, you know, MRSD program, uh, I was super big into robotics, but uh, as an electrical engineer, I was kind of working towards this idea of being a hardware engineer for robotics companies. Um, but the, uh, cost of hardware for robotics did not, uh, drop as quickly as I thought it would. And as I'm sure you've seen, um, a lot of robotics companies tend to use off the shelf platforms and focus more exclusively on the software side of things. Um, I'm not a huge fan of writing software, at least not high level software. So I sort of pivoted to, uh, more hardware stuff, uh, but also focusing on more advanced systems that use various sensors and control loops and principles that I learned uh, in the MRSD program, but not working on actual literal robots. Um, I came into EMC primarily by requirement. I mean, any product that you sell anywhere in the world is going to have to comply with a standard of some kind regulating the uh, electromagnetic noise that it emits, that it conducts, that it's uh, subject to. And so as an electrical engineer, eventually you're going to encounter this. You're going to have to deal with this. That'll never happen. Kidding. (laughs) uh, Yeah, that's what they all say. And then they hire me. Um, And so... I, I don't know. I I was lucky enough to have a mentor uh, uh, by a guy by the name of Darren Ingemarson. I think he still works for Kinetic. Okay. Uh, and he's been doing EMC longer than I've been alive. Uh, and I just, I don't know, I fell in love with it. I mean, it's it's such a interesting field uh, because, I mean, it's basically black magic. You're hunting for things that you cannot see, smell, taste, touch, or hear, um, and yet it makes your life a living hell sometimes. So, so you're basically a Ghostbuster. Basically, yes. Yes, I am. <laughs> I'm a Ghostbuster. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. So was Darren one of the guys that was with uh, Hoggins Group Automatica before the acquisition by Kinetic, or was he like Kinetic I- main? I, I think he I think he was just kinetic main. I mean he 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 EMC was actually his side gig. Um I think he was just like the principal electrical engineer, at least he was when I was there. Um but he does he did EMC consulting on the side. Um and so uh this was when I was at Discovery Robotics. We had to do EMC. There's I think a grand total of two programs in the country that teach EMC in college. Oh wow. So it's like sales. CMU, CMU is not one of them. Um, so what like, are they? Which which colleges teach it? Just out of curiosity. Um, one is the one is um, it's the University of it's in Grand Rapids, Michigan is one of them. Um, there's another one somewhere, I think. Um, but so I mean, I didn't really know a ton about EMC. And so he taught me everything I everything he knew, and it's just I 
thought it was the coolest thing in the world. Next thing I know, I'm doing a six month EMC contract uh, out in Ohio for MTD products. They've since been acquired by Stanley Black and Decker. And, you know, I've had other jobs since then, but EMC was kind of, has kind of always been there, like something I really enjoyed. So I decided, you know what, I'm just going to do this full time. That's awesome. What was the, can I ask what you worked on for those guys? This was back in 2019. Um, they, MTD basically does large uh, lawn care stuff. Cool. So ride on mowers, professional push mowers, stuff like that. Um, and this was right around the time that they were beginning to introduce battery powered versions of their um, uh, ride on mowers specifically under the Cub Cadet brand. And uh, when uh, for gasoline-powered uh, product, the only thing you really have to worry about is um, spark plugs, uh, which the ways of dealing with probably that. a source of electromagnetic interference. Uh, I mean, well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's literally a, a high-energy discharge, but it's a spark plug. Everybody has... You know, gas. So, like the way you deal with those uh, from the EMC perspective is pretty uh, is pretty standardized. It's you know, it's 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 somewhat trivial at this point. Um, what is it? Just grounding, basically, or yeah. I mean, most of the time it's because they're in uh, the metal. I mean, the engine is a giant metal block. So if that's properly sealed and grounded, then the energy from the spark plug is not coming out. That's interesting. So dumb question, but like, and this is going to reveal my ignorance with respect to the EMC, but. Don't worry, most people are. Fair enough. So there's like chassis there's... ground and there's earth ground, right? Like, yes. What exactly does chassis ground do like without actually going to the earth? Like, how do you, how do you reconcile the two? So it, fundamentally every single EMC, every single product has to have a, uh, a ground and what a ground really just means is it's the uh the exit point for all of the energy of the system um so for uh, something that plugs into the wall it's literally the uh, um the uh the the plug going back out um all of the energy that comes in is going to have to come back out at some point and so that establishes your ground reference um for more battery oriented things, it's, uh, you know, it's again, it's just, it's the negative terminal of the battery. So um, your chassis ground is usually just the, uh, um, the frame of the device. If it is a s solid piece of metal or a continue an electrically continuous uh, piece of metal, I say that because you can have gaskets and conductive gaskets, things to essentially seal those uh, gaps between plates um that sir that can serve as your emc ground because um i mean i'm sure you know what a faraday cage is yeah um so that's for people mentioned. listening right it's basically when you close up a cage around electrical activity that's probably a horrible way to explain it but so there's some so there's principles some, here yeah so there's something called the skin effect which is that yeah. if you have a um a continuous three-dimensional metal shape uh that shape and everything into it inside of it essentially gets treated as a thin sphere a, a, a thin walled box of nothing from an electrical perspective um so energy on the outside will stick only to the outside of that surface and energy on the inside will stick will only get as far as the inner uh edge of that surface huh, that's, that's basically this in effect so you know the ultimate emc proof design is something that is entirely contained within a metal box with no openings and no anything whatsoever obviously in reality that's that's literally pointless because you can't do anything with it um but the goal is to approximate that as much as reasonably possible, which sometimes is not possible at all. Uh, think of like commercial electronics 
uh, that are encased in plastic. Yep. Obviously, you know, you have to do other things well, in that case. You need that for an antenna and to be able to get out. Right. And yeah, if you've got an antenna, then you, you obviously can't put that in a Faraday cage because then it's not going to go anywhere. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Robotics. If you're in the market for elite field robotics expertise, please consider hiring SKA Robotics. They sponsor this podcast and solve some of the toughest engineering problems in the world. SKA Robotics can be found at skarobotics.com. I don't know. I find it I find it really interesting that there's uh, not more emphasis on EMC in uh, engineering education uh, because it is such a vital part of the um, electronic product development process. But I also think it's just, it's sort of, it's a symptom of the problem because there are other things that I feel the same way about, like circuit board design. Yeah. Very, very few places, very few places actually teach you how to design a circuit board. When I graduated from college, um, you know, took my first job, got into grad school, I thought I knew how to design a circuit board. I'd done it, I taught myself, I was like, yeah, I know what I'm doing here. Um, and then I took an internship at Four Moms and I designed a board and their lead PCB designer uh, basically called a meeting with me and he pulled me in and proceeded to basically as gently as possible like absolutely tear my design apart <laughs> um pointing out things that i've since learned are incredibly important but things that i had never encountered or understood before because it's not really relevant in the hobbyist space and your professors not... probably didn't know these things either i would imagine i mean it depends on what they do but it's because it's yeah. it's not a theory thing it's a it's a it's a realistic practice thing and so nobody really covers it like nobody tells you about um ground returns uh nobody tells you about uh placement of bypass capacitors uh uh the importance of using ground planes uh but also sometimes ground pores uh there's a lot of intricacy in the development of pcbs that just you got it you you learn on the job and i it, it boggles my mind because again it's one of those things that's so fundamental to design of electronics that you think any electrical engineering curriculum or computer engineering curriculum would include but they don't yeah no it's it's kind of brutal the shortcomings that you get from i mean i went to school for business and they don't even touch on sales like at all and that. <laughs> Right, so that's like something you right, have to right. Let's, on the job. Let, 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 let's say you run a business without selling anything. No, you're not going to. You'll run it right into the ground. <laughs> so. Yeah. But, I mean, there's there's been a bunch of stuff like that. I mean, I learned a lot, you know, when I was in the Carnegie Mellon Robotics Club and, and you know, like you said, as a hobbyist, I mean, I, I did a lot of stuff with Arduinos. And, and then you Woo! get out in the real world and you're like, oh, this is fragile. <laughs> you know, like... <laughs> Yeah. What was I thinking? Yeah. Arduinos are great for prototyping. There is, it, it's such a, it's such a robust, uh, su robustly supported platform that in terms of like slapping together a proof of concept with some components on a breadboard to run at some tests and just prove a concept before you go and put the effort into actually designing uh, a commercial PCB absolutely fantastic um but yeah when it comes to actually uh building a commercial product the only thing that any that you might have in common with an arduino is the processor you use and even then if you're not a fan of microchip atmel processors nope yeah it makes sense well they have some other ones too now right like i think the duo used some kind of an arm chip if i'm not mistaken and um yeah, well, yeah, I think a couple of them use... I think there's a couple that use... Uh, I forget what it is, but uh, some of the Linux... Some of the chips, like, some of the ones that can run Linux don't use Atmel pro don't use microchip processors, but a lot of them do, because microchip makes a lot more than the AVR 18... 16, 16, 32-bit devices. Um, they have uh, ARM chips. They have... 
Um, I mean, they make 64-bit embedded ARM processors, the kind that uh, similar, obviously nowhere near as powerful, um, similar to what you might find in a you cell know phone. cell phone and you know uh, an M2 MacBook, that sort of embedded ARM processor. Um, Atmel makes those, so I mean they have their controller portfolio is huge, but so is everybody else's. Um, so that's uh, pretty interesting. Yeah, so I guess it does make sense just as a first pass, and right, you know. But I don't know. I mean, I feel like the more I work with kind of more seasoned engineers, the less I see Arduino's like involved even from the start. But I, I, some people, some people don't. Um, if, fundamentally, uh, I mean, I would never use. I would never include an Arduino in anything uh front facing yeah i guess where it could uh, come in handy is if you're trying to get the software team and the electrical team to parallelize and like while the electrical team is designing the board you're trying to get the firmware team to start working with it and you can find an arduino with the same chip as you put it as your yeah board. You, can definitely, you can definitely do that yeah. but yeah like i would i would never demonstrate anything to uh to a potential customer or even um uh, you know, a high-level manager at you know a company I worked for using an Arduino because it, it looks by definition it looks slapdash. Uh, but uh, in terms of like if I've got a circuit idea and I've got the components and I need to know in you know by the end of day today whether or not it will work, you know I'm 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 reaching for an Arduino because I know that I can use it. Uh, I can know that I can so use it's just it. equivalent to like a breadboard, except you know we don't have all uh, through hole components anymore, so you can't necessarily breadboard everything. Right, and that's that is that's that's why a lot of people that's that is another reason why people you don't see them anymore because there are a lot of things these days that they just don't make in through hole because it's a pain in the butt, um, especially with how um, dense some of these some new chips are uh you just could not possibly put enough through hole pins on it to make it functional i mean you know that they use they make bgas if you see a, if you see a chip and you can't see any pins it's probably a ball grid array it's probably small but it could have an, it could have hundreds of pins on the bottom um that you just can't see uh i try not to use them because if something goes wrong there is no fixing it because you cannot access any of the pins. Yeah, and I mean, from a production perspective, I mean, unless your line is equipped for ball grid arrays, it can be pretty challenging. Dicey. Yeah. Yeah. So, but some, I mean, you got to do what you got to do sometimes. Yeah, if you need it, you need it. Exactly. Give me an example of a time you got called in to deal with something EMC related and you didn't have very many options like, you know, just late in the game and like, what do you have to do and what could you have done if you had more time? So, uh, actually, so when I was working with, um, MTD products, uh, by the time I came in, like the, the product was not only was the product already designed, um, but what they had essentially done was they, took one of their gas mowers, they took the engine out, uh, put in some batteries, uh, and then they put, um, like, you know, they put motors, you know, they put motors in it, and so, like, there was, there was a lot of dead space in that thing, because it was meant to house a, um, you know, a giant, you know, combustion engine block and not a couple batteries. Um, so suffice to say, there were some issues. Uh, some and more batteries, right? <laughs> well, in this case, that would have been a very bad idea because there was one issue that I was, like, dealing, that I was chasing around, running my uh, probes along these giant cables trying to figure out where the heck it's coming from. Um, and I 
start to realize that it seems to be coming from the battery itself, which makes no sense to me because the battery is Panasonic branded. The battery, you know, it's a battery. It's off the shelf. You'd expect a battery to um, be certified by its manufacturer to not be a problem, which is... Uh, but when I talked to my the guy the my manager about it, I discovered that while the battery cells and the enclosure were Panasonic, the actual um, chip that was essentially down uh, converting the battery voltage to the voltage that the system needed. It's like a battery maintenance system or a regulator or some combination. Yeah, a regulator charge circuit all that stuff that had been made by MTD engineers in like Arizona or something. And not only that, but they had the bright idea of trying to build this thing from scratch using like MOSFETs and uh, stuff like that. And this thing was just screaming um, so like they came to visit and I showed them the issues and they showed me the schematics and I was like, what on earth are you doing? They make this stuff off the shelf, respin this board so that you're using, you know, you're not overcomplicating this. They did. And the problem more or less went away. Nice. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's, it's one of those things, but like in that case, you know, if I had been there from the beginning, the second they suggested, hey, we're going to do this, I would have been like, no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not. Um, and you save money, not only all of the time that was spent to design that, but also the money that was spent uh, producing those boards. I mean, circuit boards aren't re are actually not that cheap until you start producing them in very large quantity. Um and even then, they're, they're you know, you know, a circuit board, especially a really complicated one, it does not cost like two dollars. Um, so there's serious time, there's serious money in in there, and also time because I these boards. The engineering cost is most of it. I mean, speaking of time, um, I would say the engineering cost over the PCBs, but there's also the time because spinning a board isn't an overnight process it takes weeks oh i see um, so you mean the time the pcb fab had it and... right and so all of that time where you uh that time if all that time is spent building a design that you have to then throw out it's wasted because because spinning the the next design of the board is going to take the same amount of time yeah so that's that's why uh, what I try to emphasize with my customers is that EMC is not this sort of check, last minute check at the end, hey, we're good to go. Um, that will get you in trouble every single time. The best way to deal with EMC is to incorporate it into the design process from the very beginning. Um, understanding what you have to comply with, what your what parts of your circuitry are gonna are presenting the highest risk. Um, so that way you know to test and design those parts in, independently to make sure that they're working well. Um, and all the way down to the actual design of the circuit itself. Um, the amount of EMC noise that you can mitigate just by carefully designing and tuning a switching regulator is, I mean, I can't, you know, I can't say it enough. I mean, when I when I when I see when I look at a you know the frequency readout of a device that's failing, almost always if it's the first round, you'll see at the lower end of this frequency spectrum, uh, most most products are um, tested from thirty megahertz to a gigahertz. Um, you'll see at the lower end, so the entire noise floor lifted above the fail line. When that happens, the first place I go 
is the switching is a is the voltage regulation because if it's a switching regulator i guarantee that's part of the problem interesting um, i mean it makes sense you've got an inductor there and a, an inductor is literally when there's uh it's creating a magnetic field and it's using that to regulate the current passing through it so if you're not carefully uh if you're not carefully uh, main, uh, if you're not carefully managing that current, the worst case scenario, your inductor hits resonance, and hilarious. That's 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 about as bad as it might sound. Um, but there's also the fact that like EMC can come from so many different places. Like even on switching regulators, the Fundamentally, when a voltage shifts, in that instant of shifting, essentially you have an AC signal for that brief moment. Um, and that very, very sharp change in voltage requires a lot of energy. So if you don't if you so if you don't design it carefully, that energy, is going to get emi going to get emitted, and you're and these switching regulators, I mean, they're switching. So literally, your your voltage is cornering hundreds of times a second. Um, so you to eliminate as much as possible noise from a switching regulator, you have to tune it very very carefully. All the capacitors, the inductor, the resistors, the MOSFETs, every single part of that circuit can help or hurt you when it comes to EMC. So whenever that, so if I'm, if, if someone's got a problem, the, that is always the first place I go because it's always a problem. Interesting. Now, dumb question, but what's like the worst thing that can happen if you've just got something that's radiating a ton of, you know, emissions? I mean, I mean jamming signals. Um, yes, for one. Yeah. Um, so I mean, the F the FCC's primary primary uh, function in terms of EMC, same with all the regulatory regulate regulatory agencies around the world, is protecting the spectrum. Um, there's a lot of information traveling everywhere at all times wirelessly. And uh, some of that information is critical. Uh, it can be related to um, medical systems, uh, public safety, all, all that information. A lot of it is traveling wirelessly. And if your device is causing, is radiating too much, you can interfere with that. You can also interfere with devices around you. Um, one of the things that uh, in addition to emissions, um, you also have to test immunity. Um, but even that's only within a certain range of essentially expected values. So the, they, they don't test to see if some crazy loud burst of energy from somewhere is going to uh, mess with your system because that shouldn't happen. Uh, but that means if your system is causing a crazy burst of energy, you can mess with other systems. So it, it, it's really, it's about playing nice with your neighbors. Interesting. Um, we live in a world full of electronic devices. And also being able to tolerate an unnice neighbor, it sounds like, with immunity. Yeah, it, it's essentially. Um, so, I mean, and this is why EMC is so important, because the number of devices that are electronic in our lives is just rapidly increasing. I don't have any electronic devices in my life. <laughs> Lucky you. Uh, <laughs> um, Jeff, I'm and... Amish. I, I'm, I'm over all of it. <laughs> yeah, it's... You, you really just... You have to be careful because without regulation, these devices, the, the impact that these devices could have on each other is ridiculous. And it does happen. Um, I heard a story uh, from 
uh, an industry veteran I spoke with last year um, about a uh, um, there was an AM radio in the kitchen, um, and every time he would open his refrigerator, the signal would go wonky. Oh, that's interesting. Um, because uh, some combination of the metal in the door itself and the electronics in the refrigerator when that door was opened messed with the AM radio signal. So this is this is not a hypothetical thing. So this the is door a, just the electronics just were poorly designed and the door was acting as a Faraday cage, basically. Yeah, it was. Well, it, uh, I, I forget. I forget if it was just interfering with the AM signal that was traveling to the radio, or if it was actually generating so much noise that it was introducing static on the signal. I forget exactly which it was, but yeah, this is this is not a hypothetical thing. This is a thing that really does happen if you're not careful, and that's why it's that's why there are regulations governing it all over the world. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, especially like if you have like a medical device that doesn't have immunity and you open the door on your fridge <laughs> and your pacemaker just stops. Working. Right, 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 right. <laughs> yeah. You don't want your, I mean, that's what I like to say. My job is to keep your fancy smart light bulb from messing with grandma's pacemaker. That, yeah. that, that, that puts it in pretty, pretty clear terms right off the bat. You know, I still do robotics stuff, you know, for funsies because, you know, robotics is awesome. It's just, it's ultimately not what I ended up doing professionally. And, you know, I found something that I love doing, and so I'm okay with that. Fair enough. I really do love doing this. Um, I ha I take a very holistic uh, systems, system-wide approach, uh, start to finish. Uh, and I also... I mean, if you if if anyone wants to go to my website, vertilightconsulting.com, you can see how I've broken down the different ways in which EMC uh, can have an impact on every single different uh, phase of your design, and that's the approach that I take. So, you know, I can help you fix your problems, or I can just come in and look at your schematic and say that's going to be a problem. You should do something about that, and. That's that's sort of my uh, philosophy when it comes to being a consultant, and that's what I try to do. So, uh, you know, anyone, any of your listeners who are struggling with EMC can reach out. I'd be happy to help. What's the best way to get a hold of you, Jeff? Um, so, if you if you go to my website, um, there's a contact form. You can uh, reach me there, or you can just email me. My email is pretty simple. It's uh, jblum, J-B-L-U-M, at vertilightconsulting.com. Either way, I'm here. Awesome. Well, hey, thanks for coming on, Jeffrey. I had a great time. Uh, it's good to see you. Yeah, of course. Great talking uh, with you. Fun catching up as well on my end. Yeah, awesome. Thanks for joining us today. If you've made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Robotics. If you're in the market for elite field robotics expertise, please consider hiring SKA Robotics. They sponsor this podcast and solve some of the toughest engineering problems in the world. SKA Robotics can be found at skarobotics.com. Thanks again and see you on the next one.